Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Tie-Dye Mindset. This is a podcast for the Tie-Dye community, focusing inside the minds of expert dyers that have elevated their craft to new heights and are making the world a more colorful place. My name is Greg Foster, and in today's interview, I get to talk with Thomas Kenny, founding member of Tribe Ties. He is a very accomplished dye artist and at the forefront of innovation in the dye art community. He is the son of uh, infamous Paul, Paul Kenny. They are together credited as creating the Kenny style, kind of what I'm wearing today. Uh, Thomas is just an amazing dye artist, a really nice guy. He was really open and and uh, wanted to get the word out, and he graciously consented to being interviewed with me today to share his experience and knowledge. So all us tie dyers, we can understand the mindset of what it means to be an uh, expert dye artist, and hopefully elevate our craft and, and bring it to uh, a level of art rather than just fashion. I hope you do enjoy the interview. Uh, you can find Thomas's work on Instagram at Tribe Ties and also at Thomas L. Kenny. Uh, yeah, so give it a watch. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe and like buttons and give me a comment or two. Let me know if there's anybody you want me to talk to. Other than that, you guys have a great we day. We are with Thomas Kenny. If you aren't familiar with the Kenny family in tie-dyeing, where have you been? Under a rock. They have got, for me, one of the most uh, engaging and visually stunning styles that uh, that they have developed and uh, have shared with the world. If you haven't seen them, check them out. Um, Thomas will tell you a little bit about uh, where you can see a lot of his work. Again, if you're just joining this, uh, this video cast or whatever you want to call it, and finding out who Thomas Kenny is for the first time, uh, I highly recommend going to uh, Instagram primarily, Zetsy page, and other other outlets. Facebook, yeah. But Instagram is definitely the best way to go. So, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Absolutely. super excited for this one. Uh, this is like a, a jewel in my crown, uh, a feather in my cap, a notch in my belt, whatever you want to call it, to, to have you on this video interview. I am super stoked. I know you and I have had a little bit of interaction through Instagram and you have been super open and really friendly and shared just uh, openly with me. And I really appreciate that. And like I say, it's just a real pleasure. And I've been really anticipating this one. So welcome. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to be here and uh, let everyone know a little bit about myself. The Kenny family, tribe ties, our origin story, and whatever else you have uh, at, for me and you want to know I'm a pretty oh, open God book blocked. so I'm ex I'm excited to get this started so let's just let's get into it what do you want to know first all right cool Thomas well thanks again for being here all right so like you said origin story man tell me a little bit uh you're a little unique I think in the sort of upper echelon of the tie-dye industry you were actually born into this uh, your dad, Paul, is a very uh, popular, very well-versed uh, tie-dyer in the community. I should say dye artist. Uh, I really like that term that has been coined because I think there is a difference between the crafter, where I consider myself right now, I'm trying to elevate my, my work, uh, and then the dye artists, those who have really taken it to the next step and, and every time they put a piece, well, relatively every time they put a piece out, it is a work of art. Um, so yeah. yeah, hit me with your origin, man. Where have you been? What have you done? Why tie dye? Why carry that family mantle? And and yeah, man, drop some drop some bombs on us. Yeah. So my my interaction with tie dye, I've had it around for my whole life. Uh, I've been dying in some way, shape, or form basically since I could walk. Now I would say though that that didn't really have an impact and a meaning on it till about seven or eight years ago. So. Um, you know, I, I thought tie-dye was kind of cool in high school. I had a few shirts, but I don't think the complexity of what my dad was doing at the time and, you know, the tie style and the fact that I wasn't necessarily seeing a bunch of other dyes really translated to, you know, being raised with something unique. I almost took it for granted. I was like, who cares about tie-dye? Um, and so I, I, you know, I graduated high school and I ended up going to UC Santa Barbara to, to, do, my, uh, to do my university studies. And 
uh, I mean, even the first year I got there, one of the things I had was, you know, one of Paul's wall hangings that I put up in my room just as like, you know, because I saw everyone had wall hangings from like Amazon. I was like, oh, I can just, I'll get one of these and hang it up. And I had like lights under it and, you know, people would come over and they're like, damn, that's really cool. That's a really cool piece. Like, I started getting all this positive feedback about it. I was like, that's interesting. And I had a few shirts that I would wear out um, from my dad. And, you know, every time I would wear them out, I'd get some sort of comment and feedback. And it wasn't before long that, you know, my friends kind of started taking notice and said, hey, this tie-dye is really unique and cool, man. Like, this is something we've never seen before. This is, you know this is something special. Can you teach us how to do it? And I was like, I, I actually have no idea how, how to do the tie-dye. I've dyed stuff before, but I couldn't possibly tell you where to begin with making it. And that, that, that's how it starts for a lot of us, right? Is we don't, like, the first step is a step into the unknown. Yeah. We're going to try something you've never tried, you know, the first time. And so part of our challenge was convincing my dad that he should even you know share this because he had you know tried to share it over the years with people before I don't know whether it's he didn't do a good job of explaining it or the the bar for physical entry was so high that people never persevered but he taught a few people and no one really was able to do much with it so when we first you know got to asking him, it was my uh, friend Will, one of the, the founding members of Tribe Ties. He was pretty dismissive of the whole thing, which is funny. So after a bunch of harassment on our end, my sophomore year of school, he came down for a day, and in our uh, in 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 me and my roommate's living room, we had like eight to ten people over and had like a mini like tie dye class session almost and there's video I have uh, not videos but photos of all this and so my sophomore year uh, I was like 2013 is the first time I learned how to tie a shirt and tie a piece and unlike the tutorial and kind of tips and stuff we have out now I literally was given the instruction by getting shown how to tie a shirt once and then was told to kind of figure it out from there now that is actually one of the interesting parts of the origin story is this tie-dyeing community did not exist quite in the same way when I was first starting out um, doing this. It was much more limited. The tie-dyeing page on Facebook maybe had three to 5,000 people when I first started. Right, right. Um, So there wasn't a wealth of knowledge out there about how to do stuff, what the effects of certain techniques were, I only basically had what my dad had given me, what's on Dharma, and another shout out to what's on Paula Birch's site. If you haven't checked out Paula Birch's work, she really knows her dye science and puts it in a simple and easy to understand format. So shout out to Dharma, shout out to Paula. I use Paula Birch's site every time I'm mixing powder or liquid to mix dye. I mean, that's really how I learned. Because when I first started, I bought the three primaries in black from Dharma. And I was like, I'm just going to make all my own. And I somehow, I don't remember how I found stumbled upon her site, but she's got that, that, that translation from some uh, Dutch site on, on your mixing guide. And I refer to that every day, almost it, it's wonderful. I should get like a poster size and put that up in my Yeah, head. no, there's stuff like that. Some of the dye water formulations, like once you understand about them and you have somebody explain the technical aspects, mm-hmm. it can be really mm-hmm. elucidating. And that's part of what's going on at the same time as I'm learning tie-dye is I'm learning research science. I'm a, a biologist by degree and by trade. Um, I'm main job is I, I work for a microscopy company doing high-end microscopy sales support and training around the Bay Area for biologists. But at the same time, I was doing this degree, I was starting to do tie-dye, and you start to see them become very similar, um, you know, to the two sides of the same medallion kind of thing. So I'm doing research science, working on a research projects, and I'm realizing that a lot of the same ideas can be applied to tie-dye. So we start to ask questions. That's 
that's what curious people do. You start to ask, well, hey, I've seen brighter tie-dye. How do I get my tie-dye consistently brighter? That's an important question. How do I make it a reliable process? These are things we started questioning. We started, we started just experimenting. Literally, we bought like, you know, two or three hundred dollars of dye from Dharma, all of us. And then I, I had a place on campus that we could hang out and actually do art, even though I was an art major. We had a, access to an art studio, which ended up being super lucky. Mm-hmm. So we just went there and started experimenting. What does heat do? How long? What happens if you dunk it? How, just treating the fabric matter? Does the fabric matter? All of these questions, you start to understand that it's more than just slapping dye on fabric. There is a chemistry process to it. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because, you know, organic chemistry, the reason why it was basically invented was for dyeing stuff. And oh. dyeing is one of the biggest wow. industries in yeah. the world. Yeah, for sure. So you're like, well, this has been around for years, but now they're starting to be a, an internet repository. People are starting to understand science. You can look up research papers on all this. ProChem puts out research papers. That's so awesome. there's this really great connection with the science. And interestingly enough, Paul is also a scientist. He's an organic chemist yeah. by trade doing surface chemistry for uh, gene sequencing companies. Mm-hmm. So again, you start to look at the similarities. He designs dye to put on surfaces. I'm a biologist. I use dye to explore images. So there, it, it, you start to feel like, you know, as much as it's an art, I can also apply science to it and start to figure out how I can hone my own style, how I can make it better. So we're doing this all. And we start getting a lot of feedback from not just an online community saying, hey, that's cool. We've never seen anything like that before. But also our fellow classmates. People caught on fast that this was kind of unique. Mm-hmm. And even our first shirts coming out, you know, the RAs would come over, the, the people overseeing the, the halls, and they'd say, hey, can we buy one? Like, I guess, because <laughs> our first rule at first was we didn't care about making money. We were doing it because we wanted to have fun. And it was certainly a lot of fun and we were getting you know definitely emotionally rewarded from doing it um it's very satisfying i think to have someone say hey that's really cool i've never seen anything like that before i think that really gets your brain going say hmm i've never had someone really say something like that so how can i keep doing it so also around the time i was super into the music scene um in uc santa barbara and isla vista uh i I was in marching band in high school so i had a number of music experience um but when i got to santa barbara i didn't bring my instrument with me and that was another thing i felt like i was missing with music in my life so we started throwing these giant outdoor uh raves in people's front yards so we had like a 5,000 watt sound system we'd drag around with two 18 inch subs and 15 inch cabs and you know they have a sound curfew in ucsb but we would you know, party from nine till 12 and have five to 600 people in people's front yard. So I was doing that at the same time. And then we realized, you know, we could combine these two ideas together. We can make the tie dye a form of promoting and feeding back into the art community and support supporting a local art community. So we started doing that. And it wasn't before long that people in the actual art community caught wind of what we did. And they offered us gallery space. They said, you know, your work is so impressive. Um, We'd love it if you came and did a showing of all your work in our gallery space on campus. And we're like, all right, that sounds amazing. (laughs) Well, totally. No, we don't want more exposure. We don't want legitimization of our work. We just want to be stoner hippies. (laughs) Exactly. And, and, and that, and so that was very validating for us to get, acknowledged by the art community which we were kind of trying Definitely. to break into so we did we did a two gallery shows while we were in santa barbara my junior and senior year awesome. and at both of them we had live music and it was an <clears throat> intermingling event it was a lot of a lot of fun so that's where we started you know pushing it into this high art realm i, mm-hmm. I started realizing it's like 
you know, what's the difference between someone splashing paint at a canvas and calling it modern art and me spending a bunch of time, intention and knowledge putting this seemingly random but controlled pattern on a piece of fabric? And the answer I came up with is there really isn't a difference. It's all about how you present it and the intention you have while making the piece. Exactly. You know, I, I've, I've wrestled with that with some of the more expert uh, dyers out there about how to legitimize this as an art form. And what I really think it boils down to, and, you know, correct me if you feel differently, but I think it really boils down to the fact that, that we're doing it more, uh, the most visible way that we've been doing it of late is on a t-shirt or an article of clothing that is fairly um, inexpensive. You know, the entry point, at least, from a crafter standpoint is pretty low. I mean, once you get into some of these expert pieces that are, you know, a hundred so dollars for a piece, you start to see that, oh wait, this is actually meaningful. Um, I think the, the, the roots of where tie-dye began in that sort of counterculture, you know, um, I'm just making a beautiful piece of art to trip out to kind of thing. I think that still is stuck in, in the mainstream as far as the, the importance of where this uh, art form is. Um, I think especially within the art community and with the tie-dye community, we are really beginning to see that transformation from a simple craft or hobby into a real profession and a real art form. Um, and, and exactly like you said, what's the difference between some guy splashing paint on a canvas and a piece of work that has been meticulously crafted, meticulously worked, and exactly what you talked about was the science behind it all, to really understand the differences between time, temperature, concentrations, you know, that takes a very particular type of person, a very... Um, um, introspective and patient person and artist. I mean, that's what it, art it, it, it wasn't instant results for us. We spent, right. you know, three to five years right. getting to where, you know, it was consistent. Every piece we put out was something, not every, but most of the pieces we put out were something we were proud of. It, it didn't happen in six months. It didn't right. happen in the, it, it took, time Long and time. Yeah. that's what i tell people and i'm sure you got this from me is like we're happy to show you what we do we've put it out there um but it's not going to be instant gratification right exactly even like you said even with the tips and tricks that you've given me uh the best piece of advice that i've received from you is it, practice you know do it there's no substitute yeah. for learning this art. And, you know, I, I, I go back to some of the, even the big masters of canvas painting or fresco painting, you know, Michelangelo, Picasso, Dali, these guys didn't just start with, you know, the Sistine Chapel. That and took sketches. A, <laughs> it took a lifetime to get to that ability. And yeah. people, you know, in this instant gratification age want to be proficient in a specific, since they've done a spiral and it looks good, or they've done a scrunch and it looks good, or maybe they've graduated to the ripple and it looks good. They think that they can go to some of these even much more advanced techniques and think that their first try is going to be perfect. And that's just not the case. I mean, my I first mean, it might be if you're lucky, but... <laughs> <laughs> Repeat, it. <laughs> Repeat it. Exactly. That, and that that's the big... That's another one of the big drivers of turning something into an art is consistency. Right. And that's the next part of the story that's so important to tell is, you know, once we figured out how to make stuff right and could reliably do it, you know, I was trading with other tie dyers at the time, seeing the colors, the vibrancy of what I was getting back. And overall, it's pretty low. Mm -hmm. like it's okay. But I'd definitely seen brighter pieces. I'd seen more consistent pieces. I had made some brighter pieces. So I was like, you know, it's one thing if we're the ones making bright pieces. It makes us look good. But it does nothing to legitimize the whole industry. 
right. does absolutely like me being good at something does nothing to to take the idea of tie dye and turn it in art, into an art. To do that, you want to you know see a change across the board, across the form, mm-hmm. and so we just started sharing with people because that's yeah. the other thing you do with science. You <laughs> share it with people. You don't say, "Hey, this is like here's." exactly how to do it you can just copy me and claim it's your own we have you know rep references for that but it's this idea of you give people information and then they can start building their own tool set to find new information and to make new ideas so that's what we started doing started talking to people like austin um pretty early on um he sent us something paul sent him a did a collab with him and that he still hasn't sent it back. And you can see the color difference between how Austin was dying at the time with ice dyes and how Paul was applying liquid dyes. And it's really striking. It's a great piece. And it shows, I think a turning point in, you know, Austin's tie dye work, but it also shows a big turning point in the tie dye community as a whole. Cause again, this is when we started saying, hey, these are some aspects you might want to think about. You know, we put the dye formulation on the tie-dyeing page. It's there. You can look at the dye formulation that we use. We have it. Do I have all the tips and tricks I've learned from over the years about how to get different effects on the styles? No, but that's, that's the part of the fun I leave for most people. And by doing that, you give people a base to build off on Again, it's not instant gratification. These masters who are taking it, Timothy, Austin, asking how do you get it so bright, they're taking it and they're adapting it to making it work for them and their styles. Mm-hmm. Do they look similar? Yes, but they're making it work for their product and they're releasing higher quality products all of a sudden. So you see this like exponential mm-hmm. tick in not only just tie-dye in general, but good quality tie-dye coming out from these artists. Mm -hmm. Some of that has to do with, you know, the market grew as the festival scene grew, but some of it also has to do with the fact that when you can make consistent work and you're not afraid that your work is going to be subpar Mm -hmm. after you put a bunch of time in it, you can command a lot more money for it. You can slowly push the price of your product. So that's what happened. And when you push the price of the product up over the field as a whole, it subsequently increases the value of my work. And that was more what I was going for. It's like, yes, I, we can charge people 150 to 200 bucks a shirt, but that's, I, I feel like that's a little bit steep, you know, to keep t-shirt it. After where, all. Oh, what? <laughs> it's a t-shirt after all. Yeah, exactly. It's a t-shirt. <laughs> I want you to wear it and use it. I don't want it to be something you're afraid to take out. Right, um, right. <laughs> obviously there's a price point on that. So it's like, how do you start to make, you know, collector pieces? How do you make it unique? Something that's going to last a lifetime. It gets, again, it changes the questions you're asking from how do I make it good to how do I make it different? How do I do something different? How do I put the tie-dye in a new light? And so this is what all these crazy good artists started to do. And, you know, one of the things with a community and having a community is you have a bunch of like-minded people together and you can bounce ideas off of them. I think it's, I I can't admit that we came up with the whole end product I do today on my own. There were tons of other great tie dyers and some of my friends like Wilshire who helped me ask the questions, helped me self-reflect, showed me stuff that I didn't know before. Mm. Um, And that's, Everything you learn, if you keep an open mind and are willing to just take tidbits from everywhere, see what you like, see what works, you can get really successful. And the other thing, too, is, again, people started realizing, you know, there's this difference between craft and art. And a lot of it just has to do with the time you spend on something. I can whip up spirals in five seconds with a fork on my table. No problem. Slap die on. But to make... One of my Kenny style tapestries, you know, I'm going to spend 12 to 15 hours tying it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thinking about it. And my hands are going to be thinking about it. <laughs> and I'm going to be thinking about it at work. And that, like, that's the intention 
and like part of me that goes into every piece right and so you start seeing that too with other artists you start seeing it with austin with timofey with takafumi and the scene just takes off um and i mean i can talk about all sorts of you know crazy good tie dyers all day but oh, yeah. you're, i think you're seeing some of the benefits of being open yeah with mainly the dye style the tie style is another thing that's interesting to talk about so you know we we figured out how to make it more robust over the years so it's easier so you're knots don't slip off because you're using one piece of string right which i don't know if a lot of people realize that but using one piece of string and keeping it taut the whole time and secured to the shirt is not easy <laughs> um and anything you can do to prevent it from popping off is a a huge help but um our tie style is you know paul got it from looking at the edge of these symmetry shirts in the, the 70s and 80s and said, I really like this like scrunchy pattern. I want to do it on the center of my shirt. Um, but even before that, the form of tie-dye we do is a form of shibori from Japan. And that's, that's the other interesting connection. Shibori in Japan is not a craft form. It's kimono art form. Yeah. People doing like tens of thousands, if not close to hundreds and thousands of dollars pieces of fabric art on these brilliant pieces of silk. Um, and we practice a form of neamaki shibori. So uh -huh. it's this idea that you pull and then bind with the string. They actually have machines that do this. Oh, wow. um, so it's a little hook that, you know, hooks in and the hook then pulls the piece of fabric up. So you're not sitting there pinching with your fingers. And then it has a spool that winds around and gets it tight. Cool. So that's, if you look it up online, you'll see these like, they don't necessarily do it symmetrically, which is the modern like psychedelic take on it, but they make these beautiful patterns with these circle resists. And typically they also use indigo dye, yeah. um, but there has been some more like traditional acid dyes. So that's kind of where we came from. And the Japanese and other cultures have used fabric art as a form of art and high art for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So this idea, again, that tie-dye can't be a modern American art form, I just thought was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I looked at is I was like, in our, the high art community, what, what are people doing that isn't just making originals? Because this is the other problem is, you know, I, I love doing tie-dye, but it's not my career. I have a I have a day job and so I have limited amount of time and I even in college I had limited amount of time I could make pieces but everyone you know once they start seeing it they wanted a piece and I felt a little bit guilty about not being able to provide it or somebody wants something in a specific size so I, I started looking towards other art communities and I realized like prints are very common like very oh yeah very very common in fact Prints and royalties are arguably how most artists make their money. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. And I was like, hmm. Give me one second. I'm going to go for it for a second. I got to let the dog out. <laughs> that is just uh, tremendous, for it. tremendous insight. You know, Thomas, um, I understand. I mean, just understanding what you've dropped on us the last few minutes uh, is there is truly uh, a space for this as an art form. And that's kind of what I'm getting from a lot of the experts is um, there, there's kind of, what I found really is there's two kind of camps of, I need to keep this really close and tight to my chest because I don't want people to dilute this art form and, and, and make work that, you know, I should be making. And then there are people that I think you fall more into is being open and sharing um, with what they've learned and what they know. Now you're a little different in that you're, you're looking at giving them fundamentals rather than explicit instructions. There are some people out there that are very explicit in how to do uh, some of the work that they do. And, and, I mean, if it weren't for those types of people, I wouldn't be where I am today with my work. But then again, it takes 
somebody who's committed to this art form, just learning it to really have a critical eye, taking a piece of artwork and then taking a few minutes to understand, okay, how do those undulations come into that? work, where are the signs of how the tying was done? How can I incorporate that into what am I doing? And then looking at their own shortcomings, you know, like the first couple of attempts at a Kenny style, I think I've shown you, were just these kind of circles all over <laughs> the place. Yeah, the they, like, they tend to be bigger, <laughs> well, the larger those, knot things. How do I get those tighter? How do I get those on top of each other? What are some of the, and you know, it took me a good half dozen tries until I got to something that very, very remotely resembled uh, a Kenny style and that I was like, okay, I'm starting to see progress and I can do this next time and I can do that next time. And now I just need to learn a little better about the dialing uh, technique. And, and, and like you say, it's really about making it your own. Yeah. I want something that I find as engaging and as visually stunning as what you guys are putting out there, but there's no way in heck I could attempt to put something as close as to what you guys are putting out or like Josh Cohen or some of these other guys that are taking that Kenny style and really, really nailing it out of the box every time, you know? And I just really kind of wanted to get your insight into, um, you know, I, I think I understand where you stand on this, but I'd like to hear kind of your insight on what is it that kind of gets people to think like, I, I need to keep this close to my chest. I can't share anything. You know, what, what's your, yeah, I mean, you, you, I, I can understand it. And I think it's less that they don't want to share it. Otherwise they wouldn't post photos of what they do online. Right. Um, there are tie dye artists, um, that are prolific that you actually don't see any of their work online, but you see it all over the Northwest, uh, Marcus, um, from So It Seems Side Eye. He, you know, he basically has a close to a couple hundred thousand dollar million empire. You're not going to see him online. Um, and the way he does tie dye is totally different because he's commercialized the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I think some of this gets into a business mindset, too, because the second you make tie-dye your career or you make it a huge supplemental portion of your income, like, you want or need to have a payout. You need to have some form of, if I'm going to commit six hours of my day to doing this, I need to get something out of it. I need to get, you know, some money for my time. I need to be able to take my family on a vacation or something if I'm going to be spending all this time doing this. Uh, so I, I can understand the fact that people don't necessarily want to share all their hard work, but they put time and like time and effort into learning and boil it down into a five minute YouTube tutorial where the appreciation they're going to get is a bunch of people asking questions and calling them greedy for not sharing more. I've seen it. It happens like almost every time, which is why there's a lot of, you know, professional die artists who have been kind of turned off by the whole thing. Right. Um, I think there's a few stellar examples. Josh Shep with his Ripple tutorial, who's really figured out how to do it in a classy way. Yeah. It's like, if you want his help, you're going to pay for him as a consultant. That's genius. That's a great sure. business idea. No. And that's the other part of the art is like, you can make it, but you got to be able to sell and market it and make a business out of it. Right. If that's what you want to do with it. <laughs> it. It's, and, 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 you know, for me, I wasn't as interested in like monetizing and making a business out of the actual act of teaching people how to do it. That's why I have a much more passive approach. We have those, you know, we have our die formulation online and the set of photos of how to do the tie. And then, you know, there's various videos and things that I've hidden in places around the internet for people to find about dyeing and all that. If you start looking, there's actually quite a bit out there. I just don't <laughs> compile it in one place. It's like a treasure hunt. But I'll tell exactly. you. Exactly. 
every time I find something of yours, it's like another nugget of gold. So I appreciate that. It almost feels like the intention of doing that is for people like me to be like, ah. it a hundred percent is that is That's awesome. like, literally like, yeah, I know you people don't get to ask their authors like what they meant when they wrote a book, but that's <clears throat> why we documented stuff. We said, Hey, we're going to share this with people. Um, but you know, put some of the onus on them to learn it. It, it, it provides a barrier to entry, right? If you want to do the Kenny style, it's there. You just have to be willing to put in a little effort to look and learn about the community. That's mm -hmm. basically the bar we put up. As long as you agree to know and hear and be a part of the community, go, go ahead and do it. The other one is the physical aspect of it, but. <laughs> <laughs> and spend a lifetime with dyed hands. Died <laughs> from the sinew and, and fishing line. <laughs> yeah, the the sores from the fishing and sinew line. I will tell you, if you do it consistently, they go away. It's like flossing your teeth. Yeah, stop bleeding after a while because you have calluses. But <laughs> yeah, I had to. I jury rigged up my own fishing line puller because I was using just the bundle that it comes on, the spool that it comes on to pull it, and it kept getting stuck in there. So I'd have to like cut through a layer. So I just made my own. It's still, yeah, it's still very yeah, difficult there's still a, in the early phases of learning that technique. So there's a lot of people who use what other Sidhu calls for doing. I actually just use my hand. That's stupid. That's crazy, man. I, <laughs> I literally take the fishing line and wrap it around my hand, and I have full control over it. Well, there, come on. <laughs> so all all my pieces are literally hand hand tied that that's the that's the other thing is you will start to see variation differences just based on how people grip, control the fabric and that's true for my that's true for the kenny style but that's also true for like doing pleats and stuff mm -hmm. how sharp you can get your pleats but also if your fabric is treated with anything or not right, right? um there's that's the other camp of tie-dyeing that's worth talking about and something that we introduced the people that they really hadn't seen before. And that's the pariah style of dyeing. Um, certainly it works if you have soda ash in your fabric ahead of time and apply the dye, but right. you get a much different effect if you don't have soda ash in your fabric okay. ahead of time. And then you apply the soda ash after the dye in mm -hmm. liquid form. That's not something that was common before we showed up. Right. Most people would put the soda ash in the fabric, or if you were doing an ice dye, you'd put the soda ash on top of the ice or under the ice. Mm -hmm. um, what's nice about that is it makes the fabric easier to work with. Yeah. It's not basic and full of soda ash. Um, so you can kind of do it anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy because you do see tie dye artists all over the world doing it anywhere. Um, Takafumi Omori, I don't know if you know Takafumi. By reputation and by, yeah, very much. I mean, I hear a lot of you guys talking about Takafumi. Yeah, so, I mean, he's just been around for a substantially long time doing it. I, I would say he's truly an expert in his craft. He's done some really crazy work. But I have a story where when I went to Southeast Asia at the end of my UCSB career, I ended up meeting up with him in Thailand. Oh, wow. And I saw where he was dying and dying and it makes you realize like for a tie-dye studio you don't need that much he had this little like studio set up in Chiang Mai Thailand that he invited us to and uh, you know we made some pieces there That's awesome. I wasn't planning on making pieces tie-dye <laughs> in Thailand but you know it just goes to show you how worldwide how ubiquitous it is mm -hmm. as an art form and even now, it's kind of surprising. The festival scene is, you know, in the toilet because of current coronavirus events. Right. But the loungewear scene and the streetwear scene is popping off with tie dye. So it's it's <laughs> it's it, 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 it. You start to find it. It's a universal language. The other crazy like interaction I see is like mm -hmm. we go to we used to go to the symphony, the San Francisco mm -hmm. Symphony, a lot, and. We we're part of this really cool concert series called Soundbox, where they take, you know, pieces of music you wouldn't traditionally hear in symphonies or ideas, and they have the San Francisco Orchestra play them, but you're like right next to them. It's like, 
we would sell tie dye in line at the symphony. You know, like it, everybody you have to. Ju- yeah, you don't have to just be a deadhead. And right, that, right. That, that 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 like I I definitely have great grateful dead roots. My parents are huge deadheads. I saw Jerry Garcia a few times before he died, which. I mean, most people my age cannot say that. Um, but also, I, I think, again, I like to try to say, hey, it, there, there are two separate ideas, tie-dye and the Grateful Dead. We can have tie-dye without the Grateful Dead. And that, that's another thing we try to show yeah. with the Kenny Styles. It's not just, a, it's yeah. not just a, a, a logo or a symbol that we've copied off something. It's an original idea. It's something that you created. Um, not not to bash on people who do the scrunches because those are hard as all hell to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like to make something that lets my mind explore. I and that that's the line I always give people. Right? It's like, what do you see? Because I can see something, but you might see something very different. Because what you see is going to depend on your life experience and your world experience. It's going to depend if you're colorblind or not. People exactly. interpret the tie dye in very, very different ways, and that's that's part of the joy. Is I get to see that as a living artist. Right. I get to see people wearing my art. I get to see people interacting and behaving with my art, interpreting in my art, mm-hmm. and that's that's. I think that's one of the most rewarding parts beyond the business is you get to see people stays brightened by the color that you give them. So for me, that that like you know, I, I do it for for the credibility. I do it because I like having a side hustle, but at the end of the day, I do it because I like making myself happy, mm-hmm. and I like making other people happy. And um, that's something mm-hmm. I would ask you know other of other tie dye artists is you know why are you do, why are you doing tie dye? Is it to make yourself happy? Is it to make other people happy? I think you'll get an interesting like set of responses because it's something you have to think about a little bit in turn it's not just something you say hey i'm, I'm doing tie-dye because you have to you, you stop and think it's like why really am i doing this art form right. what do i get out of it right. and you know the tying for me is this very meditative state it's disciplined it's rigorous it's organized it's the same thing over and over and over again so these like twelve or fifteen hour pieces I do, like they're they're states they're states of meditation. I'm just sitting there doing the same thing, and oftentimes I don't even put music on while I'm working. Wow! I just zap straight in and and work on it. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll be tying a shirt and or a couple of shirts in a night, and I'll look up. I start at like six o'clock or so right after dinner, and it's midnight, and I'm like, what? <laughs> I gotta get to bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I but, going. P- Paul does it, I think, all in the morning. He yeah. ties like a few shirts before he goes to work now. Sure. Um, which is that's crazy. He can do like a shirt in an hour. Um but that again, that's practice and practice and yeah, the, he has like thirty something years of practice. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not something he just learned how to do. No, ex- exactly. <laughs> and and you see that we have this. It's funny we have a like friendly relationship where t- we call tie dye blood sport in our house because there's so much tie dye and good tie dye around that you know my brother and sister like get it and they're like super critical of it. Like, oh, that piece is okay and. So there's always this friendly competition to make something screaming and slamming. It's a nice. well, it, it's a unique guys environment. Your A game. You don't get to rest yeah. on your laurels. Yeah, no. And I don't have to mix the dye. That's the best part. Oh, that's, hey, that's the that's the that's that that's the part of this whole situation where I'm as well because I live in a a one bedroom, but I live okay. uh, you know 20 minutes from Paul. So uh-huh. whenever I want to die, he has the the studio set up in the garage all ready to go. Yeah. I just pop over. Most people would be jealous of that setup. Oh. I, I ask if ask the other pros if they could have somebody who would who did all their dye little, mixing exactly dye like dye <laughs> <laughs> Igor, mix my dyes. Yeah. Dye monkey, purple. <laughs> this is so. too blue. 
It's t- exactly. So I, 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 I'm super happy that I get to continue having that artistic relationship with Paul, with my dad, yeah. um, and getting to grow the art. I'm teaching him a thing or two about the business ends of things because uh-huh. that's where a lot of my expertise come in. Um, mm-hmm. That is my day job. I do sales by day. Right. Um, so I've applied a lot of what I've learned at my company to how you can successfully market and sell tie-dye. Some of that's on Instagram. Some of that's on, you know, like the printing and scanning projects I do. It's how do you effectively use your time to, to grow it as an art form. And not only that, the other thing about sales, right, it's it's so easy to sell to the same people over and over again. It's so easy to go to the the dead parking lot seat and basically shoot fish out of a barrel with the, a rack of shirts. <laughs> sure. For, for, for uh, lack of better words. Yeah, that's your captive, uh, <laughs> that's your captive audience. It's a captive audience. You and know exactly what buyers, you know, they always say it's easier to sell to your existing customers than to try and find a new one. It's harder to find new ones. And that's what I'm also encouraging people. And that's what you're seeing. The next stage of tie dye growth is where do we find people who haven't necessarily either bought tie dye before or viewed tie dye as an art. Um, and who, who is investing in tie-dye as an art? That's the other question is, there's people who invest in it as a craft and as something like a fashion statement, but there are other people who invest in it as an art. And it's interesting to see who those people are and do an analysis of why are we getting these people who are investing in it? So we're seeing a lot of glass blowers investing in it. We're seeing a lot of marijuana growers, Mm -hmm. hash growers investing in it. But we're also starting to see high-end celebrities investing in tie-dye. And that's the other part of tie-dye that, you know, you can take a blank garment and put dye on it. The next level is to either take dyed fabric and make a garment Mm -hmm. or take custom, like, sewed fabric and make a garment or higher-end materials. So... Those are some of the other projects I've been exploring personally. Um, the Galit Desh and Mariel Rico uh, Fusion Threads Collective. They're uh, cut and sew artists out of Georgia. And, you know, they dye the material and then Mariel sews these beautiful custom blanks out of it. So I'm working on some projects with them to do stuff some other cut and sew stuff because I think that's another way of elevating the piece. Definitely. Um, if I don't know if you know who Melanie Brummer is from South Africa. Mm-hmm. So she's interesting because she's prolific about not only teaching, but she had, she was doing a lot of tie dye fashion during the nineties and producing stuff for runways. So she has all that experience and knowledge base, although she was doing it, you know, in, in South Africa and Europe at the time. So now ta- taking what she's done, I said, hey, that it seems like we're in a really prime space in the business marketplace to start introducing these ideas of like higher end designer fashion. Because I'm sure it's the dream of a lot of tie-dye artists is to make a tapestry and have that be turned into a five or $6,000 dress. Yeah. That would be awesome. It's all about it's it's all about scaling it and making your time increasingly worth more. And I don't more know. Money. Have you seen some of what is it, Julie Engel's dresses? Uh, yes, yes, oh, where she does amazing. the crazy, crazy sinew work. Yes, yeah, she it does. Crazy good. I totally yes. got to get with her, man. <laughs> that, that, and that's the that's the cool thing is people do all sorts of different styles. Like I'm not great at sinew and folding work that's because it's not what i practice sure but other people who practice it like they have all sorts of tips and tricks it's yeah and by doing other styles you learn stuff about you know how it impacts the current style you're doing right like how does doing a smush like what do you learn about dye bleeding how does different dye bleed you can ask all sorts of questions yeah part of even Till today, this gets back to the science thing. When I'm dying something, I ask myself the question, it's like, what do I want to learn from doing this piece? What do I want to do different that I didn't do on the piece before? Right. 
Some of that can be dye mixing, how you apply the dye, uh, how you tie it, uh, the material. And that, that's, that's another part of, you know, tie dye that it's glossed over is the material you use is important. Yeah. It's the surface that's going to display your dye. Um, so, you know, if you can have higher thread count, you're going to display your dye better. If the dye has more, or if the fiber has more surface area, you're going to display the dye better. Why does rayon dye brighter than cotton? Like, that's something that I wondered. And if you look chemically, it makes a lot of sense. Sure. If you look chemically at how these dyes work, they are making a chemical connection between the cellulose molecule and the dye, the dye molecule using soda ash as a catalyst. Right. And it's soda ash is a catalyst and it also requires a basic environment to happen. Right. But when you have that, you know, linkage, uh, you can, you know, it, it's not going away, but the more of those linkages you can have, the brighter your dye is going to be displayed. Right. Right. Rayon is perfect cellulose. It's all cellulose. So you have tons of these binding sites for the dye. Also, if rayon gets beat up, the fiber like physically turns fluffy. You can look at all this stuff under a microscope too, and it's really cool to see. If you take a look at your fiber and see how much surface area it's actually taking up, you can like have an understanding of like how well is my dye going to be displayed. And that's an important question for me because if I'm making tapestries to scan or tapestries to be framed and put on people's walls, you want the brightest, best surface to see it with reflective light off. If it's too thin, you get a weird ghosting effect on it. If it doesn't have enough dye to saturate the surface, it looks almost washed out even though you put tons of dye on. Mm -hmm. So finding the balance of that for for, for tapestries can be really hard. And I spend a lot of time just still researching what the best fabric is and where you can get it. The supply chain management in tie-dye is, is an absolute nightmare, oh, especially sure. right now. Yeah. You can't get dyes from Dharma right now. It's oh. insane. Yeah. It's a problem. Yeah, big time. <laughs> big time. <laughs> like, I haven't had I, cerulean blue for months now. <laughs> I, I don't think they're going to have it again ever. Ever, yeah. Yep. How messed up is that? Uh, That's like my favorite problem. <laughs> That's my yeah, favorite. Cerulean, Cerulean blue is, is, a, is a classic. I wonder if they, what is it, like, I think was it electric? They also have electric blue is very similar to a Cerulean. But it's not single component like Cerulean. All right, so I'm going to be honest. We've gone through basically all of my questions your stream of consciousness is precise and the funny thing is as I'm, as I'm sitting here listening to you I can see how your mind works uh, not only in your 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 strain of thought uh, coming out of your mouth but how it goes into your work as well and it has really been enlightening to talk with you at length Thomas so I've only got a couple more questions for you these are gonna be a little more fun Okay. Uh, not that tie dye and all the stuff that you shared with us isn't fun because I've just been laughing it all up. I can't wait to rewatch this video. Um, so tell me what other interests, hobbies, other stuff do you do with, with your time? I mean, you're a busy man. You got a full-time job. You got this great tie dye, uh, collective that you're working. You've got all these interactions that you're trying to set up on, on the side. What else do you, what else do you do for fun? What do, what do I do for fun? No, I, I still do music. I, I, I still DJ, uh, you know, practice DJing. My brother also plays a bunch of music, so I'll get together with him and we'll jam a lot. That's a lot of fun. You know, I'd love to be able to, you know, see all my friends again at some point, go out into a forest with a generator and some PA systems and have a fun you know, camping rave or something. Come down to Central Coast. I'll come join you. <laughs> Absolutely, we love the Central Coast. Go out in the San Yanez or yeah, you know, uh, that. So that that's one thing. Um, photography is honestly another one of my passions. It kind of goes. It 
fits nicely with the tie-dye and the marketing and also with my day job of doing microscopy. But um, yeah, I, I, I love taking photos. I love traveling the world and documenting things. Um, what else do I do? Hiking and backpacking, love being in the outdoors. Um, I grew up gardening. So if after this, I'm going to go head down to my parents' place, work in the garden for a bit. Um, we grow peppers too. <laughs> that looks like a nice reaper. That's a beautiful. I, I had another one I picked. I had it for lunch yesterday. Oh my God. I was in pain. Lit. For a good lit up <laughs> and you're the world record holder for <laughs> eating <laughs> that's uh that's kind of scary we so what actually what we've done with them in the past is made pepper jelly mm, yeah. sweet pepper jelly i love that with goat cheese goat cheese that's and so like good. either habanero or scorpion do, uh, pepper ghost pepper plum jelly that i oh um, yeah it's so good with that goat cheese oh so good. Anyways, okay. <laughs> um, so what is it right now that you're most passionate? What's kind of occupying what's behind my heads, my head yeah. space? Yeah. So um, the big thing is I've been trying to get shirts out to people with Paul's help. Um, just so, you know, people who want stuff from us have an opportunity to get it. And provide a reliable way of doing that that's <laughs> that's one thing At, that's a full-time job in and of itself i'm wrangling a few people to make that happen also i don't live at the studio where the all the shirts are so that's an added like difficulty right now so i'm doing that um these hoodies that i've been doing um super into those yeah. have been really rewarding Unfortunately, a lot of them have been going to uh, <laughs> family. Once they saw them, they're like, hey, I really want one. So I have, I have a few I have to post pictures of and make a few more for sale. But they're, they're, the front and the backs are different on them. So they oh, take nice. a long, long time. Yeah. They take like two or three hours to dye because it's basically like a towel. Right. Um, so that, that's 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 another one of my projects and the third one is again scans um i i i recognize part of the appeal of tie-dye is being handmade but i also recognize part of the appeal of our tie-dye is the fact that it's trippy and random and there certainly is a marketplace for that mm -hmm. and not everyone has you know a couple hundred bucks to spend on something and i recognize that and i want to be able to provide for people who have a lower budget um i also want to with printing i'm able to explore clothing options i wouldn't normally explore um so i can also i'm looking at getting some hoodies printed and some flat pieces of two of my uh or two of the community's favorite pieces of work i've done recently so have some scans in the work um always love doing scans Will, my, my uh, business partner and good friend, lives in Monterey, and he's still working on tie-dye and doing stuff with me. So we've been, you know, trying to keep it semi-regular. Both of us have full-time jobs. He's a lawyer, and I work in sales. So, <laughs> and that's really, that's the other funny thing, too, is, like, when we were doing tie-dye, none of us were art majors, really. We were all scientists and mathematicians. So. Right, right. It's don't let don't 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 let don't let a career or a or a or a degree define your success and what you like to do you can do anything you put your mind to yeah. right i agree a hundred percent it's really interesting to see who in like my client batch who has been really enthusiastic about my work my tie-dye work and it really surprises me sometimes who are the, you know, the foaming at the mouth fans are not the people that I would have thought <laughs> would be fans of my work at all. So it. Yeah. 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 And we're, we're so hypercritical of our own work. Any piece oh, yeah. you put out, you are going to have such a different response to somebody who's seeing like a piece like that for the first time. There's so many people who haven't seen real tie-dye or think, 
pie diet is just spirals. Right. And ultimately, hopefully by the end of this conversation, that's what our the viewers have gotten out of it is tie dye is more than just spirals. Yeah. It's more than just buying a kit at Michael's or your local craft store. Right. There's a chemistry process. There's a thought process. And there's now a community that go into making these incredible works of art that you see online. Yeah, exactly. Wow, man. A wealth of knowledge. I have definitely opened Pandora's box. Thomas, you're going to have to come back for another interview for our uh, friends. I absolutely. I barely and scratched it, the surface with you. I know you are a wealth of knowledge. You and I are very like-minded. I, I was also a bio major in, in college, and I uh, actually majored more in, in plant biology, which has really led me into the pepper growing and, and uh, into that realm of my life. But uh, I think you and I are very like-minded in that scientific approach to our art and uh, in just kind of that, that, that cr critical thinking. So I would definitely love to get back with you again uh, and, and share some more insight with, with our viewers. Thomas, thank you so much. This has Anytime. been a, an amazing hour. I really appreciate it. And why don't you give a shout out for your pages where people can check you out, see your work, and how they can, you know, if they want a shirt, how they can put their name in the, in the hat, as it were. Yeah, so the, the, the main way to get anything off of us, see what we've been doing, is, is our Instagram, which is at Tribe Ties, T-R-I-B-E-T-I-E-S. Um, that's a collective of myself, uh, Will, and Paul currently. Um, all three of us have access and manage the page. Will and I do most of the email work, but if you want to get something to Paul, I'll be sure to send a message along. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the way we do drops currently is a first come first serve. So I, I have been trying to give people some advance notice that I'm going to put stuff up. Um, but basically if you see something you like, send me a DM. If you're the first, I'll, I'll try to get back to you pretty quickly. When I put stuff up to sell, um, I'm actively monitoring the page. So, uh, send a DM. The other page I'd like to shout out is just the tie-dying page on Facebook. It is a closed group just so we can, you know, control uh, who comes in and we don't get spammed and stuff. But as long as you're a reasonable person and clearly aren't some sort of bot, you will get accepted. And the wealth of information there is overwhelming. There is so much there in the file section. And if you start sorting back through and looking at your favorite artist's work by searching by name, you can find a lot of historical pieces, ideas, conversations about the art, conversations about all sorts of things. So those are the two pages I'll shout out. Um, yeah, I follow your tribe ties and I'm definitely a member of tie dye on Facebook. So again, Thomas, Thomas Kenny, you are a one and only man. It has been really, really awesome to have you on the show. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. We will circle back with you on the next video, next interview, and uh, keep tying and dying, man. Welcome to the tie-dye mindset.